Well, you're uh, Scott and asked us to, I ran to Scott, I never met him before, but I was at the women's gymnastics meet, I helped the women's gymnastics team, and he came up and asked if we'd come talk to you guys, and so, uh, Jack and I met a few years ago, I think, at the senior PGA to, uh, event. Senior Omaha. Open. Senior Omaha. Open. And uh, so I'm a, uh, just quickly about my background. I, I mean, I grew up in Omaha. I went to Washington University for college, went on to medical school in, uh, in Omaha, and then did my residency in psychiatry, I specialized in psychiatry. And then over the last 10 years, I've started working with high performers. And so initially started with some people in the military, but it evolved over the last seven or eight years as a consultant to the, to the athletic department in Nebraska and Creighton. And so my background is more on the science side of things. I work a lot with athletes and coaches and teams. And what I found out about with Jack is that we overlap so much in our beliefs that well, he came from a different angle of training than mine. But ultimately, what we're about is trying to help with the mental side of things. So. Yeah, so uh, really excited. I always like coming to Nebraska and talking because I'm a graduate of Nebraska. I grew up in Fremont, uh, went to NROTC here. I'm extremely jealous that this program is here now because I'm a big avid golfer. Uh, but I got my degree in exercise phys, and then I got my master's at KU for the military and interagency affairs and uh, collaboration, which is the intelligence agencies and your special operations forces trying to get along and uh, understand and work together, which really means getting groups of people to work together, i.e. teams. Um, like I said, I'm an avid golfer, so in those journeys of 18 years in SEAL team as a commander, uh, I was stationed in San Diego, so with Titleist uh, starting up their whole Titleist Performance Institute, I was lucky enough to uh, go through their training on you know, a level two golf fitness guy. So I try to play good golf. I was on the Navy, all Navy team, uh, won some little amateur stuff in San Diego. Today I play out of Firethorn, and I'm not nearly as good as I'd like to be, which I'm sure you all can. But anyway, our philosophies overlapped. Uh, as a team, we've been working with uh, a lot of the Nebraska teams. Volleyball is our most recent success, helping them on the mental skills. And I don't think that you'll necessarily see anything new today um, that you probably haven't either figured out yourself or heard. But you're going to see it from a different angle. And what we can tell you is that with high performers, not only in business but in sports, um, these four mental skills work but you have to work it, right? So a lot like your golf swing, a lot like anything in teaching, the mind is a muscle, not literally, but it can be trained. And it's often the thing that elite performers actually leave out. And so when a lot of people say to me, well, how does somebody go from Fremont, Nebraska to SEAL team? I just simply say, it's all in the mind, because that's all it is. And just like golf, once you've got the technical skills down and can at least hit it, some way, curving this way or that way in a repeatable pattern, a lot of your performance now becomes mental. So we'll go through our philosophy on that. And uh, if you have questions at the end, please ask. <laughs> Just a kind of a quick summary to some of the teams we worked with. This last year was a lot of fun because working with some of the smaller women's teams in Nebraska, I mean, bowling and volleyball both won the national title. And probably you're a sport that can at least relate to bowling. Some people kind of snicker at it, but in a sense, they have to do some very similar things to you guys, different set of circumstances, but ultimately have a repeatable swing under adverse conditions and be able to physically and mentally and emotionally max out when it matters the most. And so we were we had a lot of fun working with these teams, right? Well, let me say it's the same way. But of the four teams we worked with this year, they finished, all finished in the top ten of the country. And and if you ask them, they would tell you it was the mental game that separated it because when you get to that level of, of elite performance in the top ten, everyone's got the physical tools. It really comes down to the mental. Um, and then uh, Creighton Volleyball is another team we worked with. And then you, you had a little bit more in depth with men's football in a few years that Bo was here. Yeah, absolutely. I was embedded with them. I, even with volleyball, I would work overseas through Skype with individuals and teams. And, the higher you go on the performance curve, the more the mental side of it plays in. And you see that across sport. Um, obviously, my background, you know, those are just some nice logos, but I spent 18 years in special ops with everybody. Um, playing for what essentially is the highest state game that's out there, you know, combat, life or death. Um, and I think folks that aren't involved in that tend to think that it's an extremely physical uh, deal. And there's no doubt there's a physical aspect. 
but ultimately the operators and the organization works uh, with iron tough strong minds, resilient minds as we like to say. And I always get upset because <coughs> even us in the military would have briefers come from different backgrounds. And uh, there's one guy, his name's Dr. Grossman, I'm not advocating his book, but it's called On Killing. Anyway, Dr. Grossman is not a golfer. And uh, he claims that golf has nothing to do with shooting or anything like that. Well, I'm a practitioner and I'm a golfer. And I can tell you that shooting a rifle or learning to be a good shot, whether it be hunting or military type things, is almost identical to the skills needed to have a repetitive golf swing. It's just a different application of your body and your mind. But when you think of like a sniper, there's some movies that are out there, and you think of the techniques they're using to stay calm under pressure, it's very much the same type of stuff that you see in the elite golfers out there on the PGA Tour. And, uh, and I hope that you are using in your own golf game because anybody can apply. So our philosophy, we call it the space. And uh, there's a, well, you can see between stimulus and response, there's a space. And that space is our power to choose our response, and our response lies our growth and freedom. And if you think about it, um, life is all about things that happen and how we react to them. And whether it's in life or in your case, I guess if we're really specifically focusing on golf, so many things happen to us in, a, in our daily lives or in our sport endeavor, and we have a ch choice on how we're gonna react. And we really believe, and we know this to be true, that that's something you can train. <coughs> Some people say, you know, how are you gonna change that person's personality, or that's the way they're wired. And I would agree, Certain personality types, certain things about you, you can't change. But one thing we can change, what we've learned to teach even head coaches that have been at the business for 20 or 30 years is that when something happens, it's how you react to it, whether you're coaching somebody or whether you just shanked a ball, whether you just missed a putt. In that space, that's the difference between what humans can do and animals. Humans have this ability because of our frontal lobes, you'll hear about this on a video we're gonna show you, to think about what's happened briefly and decide if we're gonna to react to it. And that could be road rage, that could be you know, our spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend saying something to us that is hurtful, it could be a coworker, and how we choose to respond really determines sort of what's gonna happen next. And what happens next is everything. And then once we figure out managing this space, then it comes down to really attitude and effort. And, I, and really those are things that are controllables. And, um, a lot of things in life are controllables, right? There's a lot of distractions. So if we were taking a test, this is where I always like stomp on my foot and say, in my experience, the only thing you truly control is your attitude and your effort, right? Because if you control that space and you learn, right, to control that space and then have a good <coughs> attitude and effort in all things, it's not just for performance, it's for life. Um, what it leads to is more of a positive energy, positive psychology. And there's nothing negative that comes from that. And again, that doesn't matter if it's a talk with your girlfriend, a business partner, you're teaching a client, and that client reacts to you funny, right? How do you respond? Well, you have a choice. What you truly control is a lot in life is your attitude and effort. So our framework is positive psychology. Put up a couple examples. We can go into depth about what that really means. But Coach Bosman, I think, said it best. He said the best way to change behavior is to catch somebody doing something right and reinforce that. There's a lot of coaches, a lot of instructors in this world who, particularly if you grew up in sort of that militaristic background, the Bobby Knights of the world, really believed, and many still do, you can even see some coaches on this campus who believe in catching people when they do things wrong, screaming at them and humiliating them in front of people, and then expect them in the next second to perform their best. And Coach Osborne, I would say, used to be that way slightly, believe it or not, but he came to a conclusion one day that that was the best way. You catch people doing things right, you reinforce that behavior, you certainly put your arm around them and help them hold them accountable for things that they need to improve on. But the focus on catch is on catching people do things right. And John Wooden, the famous basketball coach, I think won 10 straight national titles. Young people need models, not critics. And, uh, it's been really hard and interesting to work with coaches who have been very, very successful, maybe winning 80 or 90 percent of their games, and having them and convince them and having them understand that there's a better way to do it. When they've been successful, but kids have changed on the women's teams and the men's teams, and they've changed in a way that they respond better than ever to positive psychology. So.
Good? So, high performance core mental skills. We'll talk about it real quickly, the, the traditional four foundations of high performance. There's the physical, again, most of those are controllable, guys. Sleep, diet, exercise, alcohol, stress. If we don't control those things, it's really hard to be an elite performer, particularly when you're competing against other elite performers. And you can probably think about a number of golfers that you've read about or heard about that are at the very top that have struggled with those things and it's either kept them from being consistently at the top or knocked them out of the game. The technical, obviously, is something that everyone's pretty obvious with. That's the skill of mastery. That's working on things day to day on your golf swing. There's certainly a tactical approach that you guys will have to take on the golf course or in life in terms of strategy and game planning and how you go about things depending on how the course is playing, where the holes, the pin setup is, or what have you. But the mental piece is the piece that we're going to talk the rest of the day about because that's the mental piece that helps develop strategies for resilience. And again, when you get to the top, it's probably the difference maker. So we changed it up a little bit ourselves just the performance amount approach to lead performance, which is let's develop those four core mental skills, let's own that space, let's control and optimize attitude and energy, that fuels the positive energy, the energy, attitude and effort, and then we've got the other three that you have to be good at. But if any one of those aren't at the top, that stool is going to be unstable and we're not going to be able to max out. So this is my favorite thing in this group because we're all golfers and we all relate. So what's the perfect example in modern times of somebody that had all of that and then one of it went astray? Tiger, Tiger Woods, right? I mean, I know he's hurt now, but can anybody honestly in this room say that as circumstance would have it and life happened, that he had a big mental hookup because of the way he was living his life, right? And then when that mental part got fractured, Wow, he's not been the same Tiger Woods since, okay? So if you don't think that the mental side of performance is that important, or as I say, binds everything together, you can master some of these other things, but once you meet up with the other elite performers, if you don't have a mental game that's rock solid, it's not gonna hold together. I mean, he held together for a long time, and I think he's able to come back. But unfortunately, or fortunately maybe for us, he's a perfect example of the mental side cracking and everything else follows. So not only is he obviously right now to get physically healthy, but he's got to rebuild his mental psyche. All right, we're going to show you a video. It's about 10 minutes long. It's going to lead into what we're going to talk about with the core mental skills. What we love about this video or what I loved when I first started showing it, I didn't even know it yet. But this was all about how the Navy SEALs have trained uh, to get better at what they need to do using the core mental skills that we're going to talk about. And whatever you do, I apologize up front. Oh, yes. not and this is very important in the processing of emotions. Within the limbic system are the amygdala two nuggets of tissue, one in each half of the brain. They are no bigger than a fingernail, yet they are the brain's central command center for our emotional reactions. One of the simplest and strongest of these is fear, a primal emotion we all share. If you have to pick one brain region that was most important in fear, it would be the amygdala. There's no better place to explore how fear affects the brain than here at the Navy SEAL Special Warfare Command in San Diego, California. Recruits are put through specialized training to change the way their brains react to fear. We introduce our students almost from day one to absolute chaos. And they will struggle. When you look at historic mistakes on the battlefield, they're almost always associated with fear or with panic. So the capacity to control these impulses is extremely important. Out of 140 candidates who start each class, on average, only 36 make the final cut. Successful recruits seem better able to adapt their brains to the demands of the job. 
It's not really necessarily the physical people who get through there. And there are been Olympic athletes who dropped out of training. And there's this 140-pound farm kid from Nebraska who'd never seen the ocean before, and he graduated. But the candidates need something more to call a super fear, like drowning. Experts believe evolution has hardwired our brains to dread being trapped underwater. As a result, it's almost impossible to control the brain's overwhelming impulse to surface for air. And it's why recruits struggle so much to pass the underwater pool competency test. Pool comp is a very important milestone in their career. They're being tested how they can deal with fear from the water. And there's controlled harassment, planned harassment, projected at them underwater. And we see how they can cope with that. Students must spend up to 20 minutes underwater, enduring repeated attacks on their breathing equipment by an instructor. Half of the time, they are without air. Their air is shut off, their breathing hoses are wrapped around in difficult positions, and they need to respond to those problems with a series of emergency procedures. Step-by-step -step instructions for untangling their gear are drilled into the recruits' heads beforehand. They must follow these to the letter. But putting theory into practice isn't easy. You go down the bottom and the instructors, they come down, they'll start attacking you, taking your mask off, just creating all this stress. And, and the more the stress builds up, they want to see how you handle it. As the trainee begins running out of air, his brain's amygdala pushes the panic button that urges him to surface. His frontal lobes must win this battle in the brain if he's to stay in control. Physically, it's very challenging. You have to hold your breath for longer than you normally would. The instructors just take you kind of to that breaking point to see how you respond. No sooner has the candidate untied one set of knots than his instructor is back attacking him again and again. The more the stress builds up, they want to see how you handle it. Will you want to go to the surface to get air, which you want to do, or will you take the little air you have and all the problems and solve them? and do what's necessary in order to pass the test. More SEALs fail pool cup at this stage in their training than anything else. The Navy wanted to know what was going on inside their recruits' heads to cause this. There's almost nothing more scary than not being able to breathe. That creates tremendous stress response. You have this huge release of stress hormones that make controlling things with thought more difficult. Under normal conditions, the brain communicates with the body using minute electrical signals. The brain sends out electrical impulses from its nerve cells to others that travel at over 270 miles per hour. This is one way your brain can tell your body to do something. But under extreme duress, the brain uses chemical hormones. The part of the brain that senses fear, the amygdala, triggers a chain reaction that sends adrenaline and cortisol hormones into the body's bloodstream. These stress hormones act as a SWAT team, quickly preparing the body for action. <coughs> they increase breathing, heart rate, and blood pressure. Senses become keener, memory sharper, and the body becomes less sensitive to pain. But even in this heightened state of alertness, pool comp is still too challenging for many trainees. Your mind is going everywhere, and you're seeing your friends come up from the water they've passed, or they failed, and you're kind of sizing yourself up, saying, well, he failed, can I pass, and vice versa. So your mind goes everywhere, and it's key just to stay focused on what you have to do. Eventually, the student completes the series of tasks and can touch the bottom and then surface to learn from the instructor whether he's passed the test. Few SEAL candidates succeed at pool comp the first time. They get four attempts, and there's more at stake with each try. The most common reason for failing at pool comp uh, is, is panic. Losing composure underwater. Some of our students, that's it. We'll, we will uh, performance drop them from training. The Navy wanted to help borderline candidates who had the potential to pass these crucial phases in training. 
after consulting with experts, they came up with a groundbreaking mental toughness program, a set of techniques to boost the trainee's ability to control fear, even in the most extreme situations. You guys have to stay fired up right after. From the pain, the gold, and all that stuff. It's going to be the way at you, but you've got to keep going. The techniques that we're most interested in are what I call the big four. Goal setting, mental rehearsal, self-talk, and arousal control. Scientists think goal setting works by assisting the frontal lobes. As the brain's supervisor, the frontal lobes are responsible for reasoning and planning. Concentrating on specific goals lets the brain bring structure into chaos and keeps the amygdala, the emotional center of the brain, in check. I got up every morning and I said, oh, I'm, I'm going to make it to breakfast. And then at breakfast I said, okay, I'm going to make it to lunch. And then I'm going to make it through the run this afternoon. And then you know, take it in these little <coughs> sort of chunks. The second technique, mental rehearsal or visualization, is continually running through an activity in your mind. So when you try it for real, it comes more natural. If you practice in your mind first and imagine and rehearse how you might do in these stressful situations, the next time in reality you're faced with these situations is actually in effect the second time you faced it. So you'll have less of a stressful reaction. The third technique, self-talk, helps focus the trainee's thoughts. The average person speaks to themselves at a rate of 300 to 1,000 words a minute. If these words are positive instead of negative, can do instead of can't, they help override the fear signal coming from the amygdala. The frontal lobes are always on, so it's very easy to think about something difficult, something bad, like I'm going to fail. What am I doing here? I didn't practice enough. What you're trying to do is you're trying to replace those bad thoughts with good thoughts. The final technique, arousal control, is centered on breathing. Deliberate slow breathing helps combat some of the effects of panic. Long exhales in particular mimic the body's relaxation process and get more oxygen to the brain so it can perform better. Breathing is a great focusing strategy. But you can only do it so much because in response to fear, your brain will get jacked up. On its own, arousal control wouldn't work. The amygdala sends out such a powerful signal, it's tough to suppress if we're still feeling fearful. But combining the four techniques made a big difference to the trainee SEAL's pass rate, increasing it from a quarter to a third. The idea of pushing boundaries may not be new, but here is positive proof that you can train your brain, and now science knows how. It's called the moon. <clears throat> we could spend probably an hour on each one of these mental skills, so obviously we're going to just go through these pretty quick for, or, uh, for four or five minutes each and talk about them. But, you know, goal setting is really critical. Again, for some of you guys and gals may be great at this already. So when we look at the core mental skills, I think or the, we want to have you think about them. There's some that you can get better at, which probably all of you can get better at. Some you're naturally good at, some may be a limiting factor. But goal setting, you look at what we call SMART goals, it gets, it's really important that you develop a strategy when you set your goals. And most people don't do it in a way that's all that meaningful. The ones that you can think about the most would be the most common kind of goals that people hear about in New Year's resolutions. And when you hear about New Year's resolutions, somewhere in the range of 95% of them fail every year. And it really comes down to the fact that people don't design them in a way that are specific enough, that you can measure them, that are realistic and achievable, that are relevant to the life situation, and that there's a time component to it. And then really you need to think about a couple of things about why you're setting that goal. Because you've got to get to the emotional part and to the why component, which is why, why don't I do this already? If you're going to set a goal, why haven't we done this in our life already? And why do I need to be able to do this now? Because when you add in the why and you add in an emotional connection, 
the chances of being successful with goals go up. Um, and then a couple of the really common themes to goal setting are processes versus outcome. Most people are really good at setting outcome goals. You know, I want, I want to lose weight. I want to save more money. But they don't get specific enough and they don't come up with a strategy on how they're going to do it. And you can think about a hundred different ones that you could focus on with outcome goals for you guys, but then the key comes down to what my process is going to be. What do I have to do every hour, every day, every week, every month to get to where I want to go? And most people fail because they don't set up good enough processes to get to their outcome. Some of the other keys to success for goals are writing them down. One thing we know is we write down our goals and we post them somewhere we can look at them every day. We know that the chances of, of successfully completing a goal go by 400%. That's 40 times. That's not a small number. By looking at them every day and writing them down. And then to be able to break them down into manageable chunks because some people can get really overwhelmed by the amount of stuff that they have to accomplish to achieve their goals. So just like you heard in the video, to be able to break it down, sometimes uh, some of our athletes, just even to get through two a days, to try to help them mentally get through an hour of the first part of practice, and we get to the next part, and get to the drills part, and the break, and the recovery, they have to break it down into chunks. And then probably the most important thing is to be able to adapt and to change. And so if we were to just use, uh, let's use a weight loss model for just an example, it's a pretty common one, but if we said we wanted to lose 20 pounds, and we're going to go to Weight Watchers, so our outcome goal is losing 20 pounds. The process are the things that we need to do, right? The number of points we need to eat, the amount we need to exercise, the amount we need to sleep, what have you. If you get through three, four weeks of that process and you haven't lost much weight, you have to look at your process, right? Which is, am I following it? If I am following it, I have to do something different. Most people find out they're not quite following what they said they were going to do, which is, Part of my process was to exercise five days a week, and they're like, well, I've been exercising one day a week. So they go back to their process and say, okay, I'm going to follow it correctly. But probably just as common is we're following the processes like we said we are. We're not getting the outcome, and we have to sit down with ourselves or somebody and say, I have, to, I have to change my processes to get to where I want to go. I have to do more than I thought I did. So those are, the, those are some of the thoughts on goal setting. Again, we could spend an hour kind of talking about how you do it properly and how you get it. Have you any comments on that? No, I just say that to put it in golf speak because uh, it's always really easy, right? I mean, how many of us have either seen people or ourselves, right? What do we want to do? We want to shoot a score, right? That's what everybody thinks. And then I'm sure you guys can all tell me where do the most strokes come from? Putting and 100 yards and in. It's pretty much a scientific fact in this game, right? So everybody comes in, you're soon going to be teaching people, or I'm going to go back out to play, and I'm going to say, I want to shoot 75 again. And I'm going to look at my scores, and what am I going to do? I'm going to go, oh, all my strokes are generally 100 yards in, putty. but yet I'm going to go grab my driver, and I'm going to go beat balls. Why? Right? My goals and my processes are not aligned. And that's a good majority of the golfers in the world. And I get it. It's fun to beat your driver. But think about that. You know, that's where things are out of whack in a golf example, which happens in everyday life with a lot of folks. And so, you know, it's good to really understand what to focus on to get where you want to go. Okay, self-talk. 50,000 thoughts a day is what we typically have. If you study the research, that's a lot of thoughts. What we do know is that the typical person tends to have way more negative thoughts than positive thoughts in the range of three to one. I'm tired, I don't want to be here, I'm at home, I'm not good enough, I don't belong, I hate my friends, my sister drives me crazy. Whatever it may be, when we really study what we say to ourselves, our internal drive, a lot more negative than positive. But what we've learned about elite performers and teams, the ratio tends to flip. And it's through training, maybe through their natural wiring, but primarily through training. And if we can get the ratio to be three to one, positive to negative, that tends to be where elite performers and teams function at their best. Um, so, <coughs> talk a little bit about self-talk strategies again, just a brief overview. But the first thing you've got to be able to do is recognize, <coughs> just what I told you, that a lot of our internal dialogue is a lot more negative than it should be. And then we have to accept the fact that that's part of how most humans are wired, particularly as you're talking about yourself, and then we need to learn 
We have to learn from it, right? We have to learn and be honest with ourselves and say, do I perform at my best and whatever I'm doing when my thought processes are negative or positive? And it's really easy to be positive when things are going really, really well. But I guess the key test is when the stress hits, what happens to our thoughts? So we have to have a strategy to learn to erase those thoughts. And probably just as important, we have to have strategies to replace those thoughts. We have to have something we do with the thoughts that are there. And it's pretty hard for most people to ignore them. We took, some people are, uh, have gotten good at sort of recognizing like a ticker tape. Here's the thoughts, and I just let them flow by and I ignore them. But most people have to have a strategy, either replacing them with positive self-talk or what we would call performance or keywords and focusing on the process. So a couple things, thought replacement, from going from something like I'm a choker to I love pressure. I always make those mistakes. I'm learning to let go. Some people, including most perfectionists, do not particularly like using positive self-talk as much. They feel stupid, they think it's silly, it doesn't make a lot of sense to them. Most of the perfectionists that we work with, and including a lot of the female, but more men than you would recognize, are really good at coming up with key words that help their performance. Words that their brain tells their body and what they need to do. Here's a couple of examples for gymnastics, particularly on the balance beam. I hope I don't fall again too. Quick hands, tight squeeze. Those words, quick hands, tight squeeze, are three very important words for them to be able to tell them what they need to do to do a back handspring correctly on the balance beam, okay? So two things that happen. One, we can't have two thoughts at once, despite everyone's belief that we can multitask. So two things that happen. One, we can, by using quick hands, tight squeeze, it helps us stay in the moment and it replaces those thoughts at the same time. So we can't be thinking something negative when we're thinking something positive. I don't want to let my team down to breathe, legs, look. Um, if any of you guys have read the book, um, uh, Seven Days to Utopia, great, golf's greatest game, I think a movie came out a couple of years ago. The, the golfer in this, in this parable came up with see it, see it, feel it, trust it, SFT. He had that written on his, on his hand. And those were his reminders every single time of what he needed to do because it was something he'd always count on. So that's just an example. Yeah, so I think it's always funny because the key, especially with golf, it's like the ultimate sport where all of this comes right out. So it's like the honesty test. So Boone here's an angry golfer. Come on, let's be honest. Let's be honest, it's the first part of it. Right, I've played with some of you, so I know, okay? I was an angry golfer until about 25. And then I went through SEAL training, got some new mental skills, and I was like, oh, this is pretty interesting. And they started to teach us how to shoot, right? Back to these basic principles, and it was trigger side squeeze, trigger side squeeze, trigger side squeeze. So why would I try? I was like, wow, maybe this will work with my golf game, right? You know, simple positive thoughts. If I ever get under pressure, shoot, that's how I do it. Trigger side squeeze, right? I get my finger on the trigger, I need to know where the sights are at, and I just squeeze it. Those are my key words, right? That's self-talk. I will shoot and talk. I will play golf when I am practicing, because these are skills you can lose if you don't practice them, I go back to what works for me. That cadence, trigger side squeeze. If you're uncomfortable with that, all right? You can develop your own. So one, recognize, all right? For all those of you that have recognized that you're an angry golfer, we gotta start getting more positive thoughts and more positive self-talk. Another great example that we all know around here, and I can say this because he's a friend of mine, is some folks hit such an adrenaline spike right, in the fight or flight, which we'll get to, they don't even recognize it. And I'm gonna say that there were times when Coach Pelini, the former football coach, in the heat of battle, would get so excited that he wouldn't even know what he was saying or thinking. And that's the truth. That's not a Coach Pelini-ism, that's, that's being a human being. I mean, that happens. Now, that doesn't always happen out on the golf course, but if you're an angry golfer, you could cause yourself to spike pretty darn hard. And it's really hard emotionally and mentally to reset and to play your best golf. And that's why I love golf, just like shooting, because it's pretty much one of the only sports out there that you can't lie at, right? And you guys get the honor to teach folks some of these skills because we've all seen folks I'm talking about and there's no way that that leads to the best golf. Jack said something really important too. These are things you gotta practice. 
you can't wait till you're under stress to practice it. We've had so many athletes that want to use their breathing or other techniques or self-talk, and they say, well, it doesn't work for me under stress, and you ask them, have you ever practiced it? They said, no, we've well, talked about it, but I've never done it. If we can't do this every day and incorporate it into our training, it's very hard to do, do it when it matters the most, when the pressure's on. Or when we're in a slump or we just had a bad shot, now we've got to get back on. When we're in a flow, everything's going well. We're pretty natural anyway and staying pretty positive. So the next part is arousal control. That's regulating our physiology. That's managing our stress response. If we had more time, we'd spend a lot more time talking about how important it is just in life, particularly as you get a little bit older in life and you start dealing with more and more pressures. If you can't manage that fight or flight, that was obviously designed a long time ago to help keep us in a survival mode, to be running away from bears and lions and keep ourselves safe. That thing is so ingrained, the fight or flight into our brain, that it's firing all day long at much lower levels than the full flight or flight reaction. Meaning, again, fight with somebody. Uh, somebody sending you a text that was hurtful. Um, a grade that came back or getting stuck in traffic. And it's firing all day long. And if you don't figure out how to manage it, you end up getting sick. Because the fight or flight system, this is kind of a busy slide, components, three parts. There's the physiology of our body, our heart rate goes up, the butterflies, we breathe, uh, you know, get tight muscles, get nauseous. Everyone kind of knows that response. And, and, what's, and for some of you that don't, the most common diagnosable condition in America is anxiety. Okay, and that's, some people have it for all kinds of situations, but here's two situations where almost everybody can relate because the vast majority of people if they have anxiety are going to have it in one or two settings giving a speech in front of people or on an airplane both of those are true anxiety disorders in those situations and anybody who has a fear of flying or a fear of speaking knows exactly what i'm talking about it doesn't mean that it happens in other situations but that kicks in that fight or flight and we, we feel sick and mentally our mind goes blank and our thoughts speed up and we start getting negative self-talk, and then there's a, there's a behavioral component. People change the way the be they behave and act when their fight or flight kicks in. So all three of those are really important to the fight or flight response. And what we know is that people are more prone to get sick, make poor decisions, and have a very hard time regulating our emotions when that fight or flight's kicking off. And if we can't regulate our emotions on the golf course or in life, we're not gonna be able to max out. And certainly a couple other things that react as it relates to golf. Reaction time goes down, our fine motor control goes down. Things that we've trained ourselves to do over and over, we can't do. And now you've seen even the best golfers in the world on a critical shot, and they'll tell you their muscles get tight, and all of a sudden they can't do what they're trained to do. And that's different than the yips, which is a whole other phenomenon. But when the muscles get tight, it's pretty hard to do what you're trained to do with the muscle memory you have. So that's, uh, any comments on that before we get to the next part of it? When the arousal control? No, I mean, I think that the biggest thing is that it, it's in you. It's just the way we're wired. So you can either choose to accept that. And there's going to be things like golf and arguments with people that are going to kick this off. And one of my main points, especially when I'm talking to golfers or people that are going to train people in golf, is if you take an attitude path that's negative, you're helping this system already defeat you right when you need to be working on the opposite of keeping it in check right because we can get ourselves all spun up and crazy just by what's going on in our head to our outward tossing clubs or whatever it is folks do these days right so you're actually working completely against yourself and trying to perform good let your body do what it's going to do you work to counteract that. Remember, animals go right in fight or flight mode, kill or be killed. We have the ability, because of a well-developed frontal part of our brain, to access that space, practice some core mental skills, which we're going to get to a couple more, one more in a minute here, that allows us to bring down that fight or flight system. So here's a, we're going to show you quick, yeah, I want to show you this video real quick on. This is a huge game center with 20 points in front of our test. He's with Doris. I got a small world piece in here. Everybody's doing it.
for my wife, Tisha, my family, my kids, everybody. I definitely want to thank my doctor, Dr. Sandy, um, my psychiatrist. She really helped me relax a lot. Thank you so much. It was so difficult to play. There's all this fuck. There's so much emotion going on in the playoffs. But she helped me relax. I thank you so much. Ron, you're able to I'm not down at three. Yes, that was a huge shot from late three. Yes, no question. <laughs> For our artist has made the most of his second chance. He's worked so hard, personally and professionally, to overcome his past. And submissions, as he referred to there, get the huge three. He is not the perfect player. He's not the perfect. Yeah, so for you guys that aren't NBA fans, but he, he hit the uh, game-winning three in Game 7 of the NBA Championships four or five years ago. And a couple things. Uh, this was a, a video we like to show to some of the male athletes because they get so... Uh, I don't know, same thing with the Navy SEALs kind of things to show them it's not so macho to learn to work on how to relax. Because that was his key component, which is I work with a psychiatrist to teach me how to relax because there's a lot of commotion and a lot of emotional energy that goes on in that type of environment. And so, um, and again, he was a guy who obviously had some well-documented mental health issues, but he did learn how to kind of revive things and manage his emotional control, hit the shot at the biggest time. So, the performance stress curve, basically the reason I, we put this up here is to let you guys know that, you know, stress is okay, right? And a certain amount of stress is actually knows how we're alive. That's why so many people love sport, for example. It's one of the few things that we really feel connected and alive with. But as, as the stress goes up, if we don't have a way to manage it, we go from under stress where we can be kind of bored or under-involved. A lot of teams that kind of get beat by a team that was is much worse than them, they come out flat because their, their nervous system isn't quite ready on fire, but there's an optimum curve, and then beyond that, performance starts to deteriorate. And we have to get good at knowing where our stress curve is. So if you go from a 1 to 10, you know, I might be at a 7 out of 10, meaning I need to be slightly keyed up, I need to be a little bit on edge, I got to feel my heart going a little bit to know I'm at my best. And somebody else in here might need to be at a 4 out of 10 to know that they're at their best, when they perform at their best. If I'm at a 7, that's my best and my heart's coming out of my chest, and I'm at a 9 out of 10, I better figure out how to bring it down to 7. If I don't figure out how to bring it down to 7, I come to the end of my competition, and I'm looking back and figuring out why I choked, right, or I couldn't get it done. Because we have to know where we function at our best, and then on occasion, we go into overdrive, that fight or flight's kick in, and we're like, oh my gosh, this is, I am so tight, and I'm so tense, and I'm so anxious. If we can't bring it down by using self-talk, by using by using um, uh, arousal control things, which we're going to talk about here, um, it won't happen. So how do we manage arousal control? Roughly? We can do three things. We can learn how to breathe. We can learn how to do some mindfulness-based training. And one way to reset our physiology, if we're really wound up, 20 to 40 minute power and nap. That resets the physiology of our body better than anything. But we don't always have time for that. But breathing and a mindfulness-based training program are something most athletes do. So, we breathe because it's important to stay alive, right? One of the things that we do when we learn how to breathe properly and use what we call belly breathing or diaphragmatic breathing is it brings in more oxygen to our brains, but one other thing it does is it pulls on a nerve called the vagus nerve. We call it tugging on 10. It's the 10th cranial nerve of our brain. I'm not going into a lot of detail, but when we pull on our diaphragm now by breathing in, <coughs> And it comes down, and we learn a breathing strategy, it actually pulls on that vagus nerve, which is the opposite of the fight or flight nerve, and it actually calms through our brain, our nervous system. That's why we breathe to calm down, rather than punch ourselves in the face, to be honest. And there's real science behind it. So, um, there's ways to learn to breathe. We don't have a lot of time to do that today, but there are, there are breathing applications you can learn. There are guided tapes. Well, that's why a lot of people learn a form of meditation. And I would tell you, most of the elite golfers, they have a meditation practice that they do, and I'm not talking about sitting down with their arms crossed going, um, they learn how to breathe and they learn how to focus doing a meditation practice. A lot of them do yoga. We can learn how to breathe through exercise and through some other things. So it's really critical that we learn how to breathe properly, particularly when we're under stress. Who, who does a breathing program in here? Anybody? 
yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't learn to breathe until combat, you know, and we were told, taught tactical breathing, which is similar. But the, the bottom line is, is uh, you can develop your own, right? You've got you've to practice, you've got to find what works for you. But I can guarantee you that for me, it was tactical breathing when I met Dr. Whitman, right? His format's a little different, but the bottom line is, is I couldn't believe how much it works. And I not only use it, if it works in combat, it works in the house when I'm stressed there, it works if I'm stressed here, it works on the golf course. But again, you've got to do it. And you've got to make it part of your life and something that you do. And then, believe it or not, I mean, your body's built for that. You're not tapping into it if you're not trusting it. We don't have a lot of time to go into this, but mindfulness is about learning to be aware. Okay, so learn about being in the present moment. If you ever read, if you study what elite performers do, they get really good at staying in the present moment. And again, it's through self-talk, it's through breathing, it's through visualization, all kind of things helps us stay in the present moment. But if we can't learn to stay in the present moment, pretty hard to really have a really content life. And we see that as you get older in life. I mean. Um, the distractions of the world and since the smartphone has come out has completely changed the way we communicate and it's really changed the way that we've been able to even keep our mind on a single topic for a half hour for 10 minutes with our kids with our girlfriends or boyfriends and what have you so mindfulness is a is a is a term that we could for a whole other time but it's really about awareness it's about awareness of where we are being present in the moment on the golf course it's a it's it's, it's because you have 90% of your time with downtime, most of the time, it's about being aware and being present is the difference. I'll tell you real quickly the science of mindfulness. This is what we learned when we just came out with this study, that people that practice 27 minutes a day, mindfulness meditation practice, which is really a breathing practice, this is what shocked us. The MRI, brain imaging scan, showed growth in a couple areas. The brain actually grew over eight weeks. We used to think the brain was kind of fixed once you became an adult, but the brain actually grows and it's flexible. The part of the brain that helps with compassion and regulating emotions grew from doing meditation. The part of the amygdala that you heard about in the film actually got smaller because as we learn to regulate our, exam, uh, our anxiety better, the guardian of that fight or flight system doesn't have to work as much. So, um, that's the science of mindfulness. That's about all we have time to talk about on that. One thing I want to tell you about on mindfulness life benefits, again, none of you guys have kids, but fully engaged in activities. There was a, a study that just came out looking at ER injuries in kids. Since 2006, since the smartphone has come out, the number of injuries in kids under the age of eight on the playground have gone up by 15%. And we figured out is that the parents are no longer paying attention to their kids like they used to on the playground where they used to be engaged with their kids, they get the kid to the playground, immediately get on their smartphone, aren't paying attention to their kids and the things that they're getting on. And when you think about how sad that is, when you have 10 or 15 minutes to engage in a conversation with somebody and your phone is out, when you look at all the studies on that, the, the, the uh, communication deteriorates and what people rate as meaningful conversations go way down simply by putting your phone out on the table. And um, it's, it's really kind of crazy. It's one of the things that we struggle most with with the athletes, I would say, to help them learn how to engage in proper communication and conflict resolution. So. Do you guys have any questions for these guys? No? Well, I got a question. Well, yeah, how do you ahead. guys uh, regulate that with student athletes with, about just phones and telling them to communicate? That's with people. Yeah, well, what do you guys well, do? Well, one of the things that we do is we try to get a buy-in from the leaders because if it comes from the coaches, I mean, the coaches can do what they want. They can pull phones away. They can, but if it comes from the coaches, it's not nearly as powerful if you can get the team leaders to come up with a plan that says during these time periods, the phones go away, right? Because if you don't have a plan, the phones don't go away, right? There's no way. Or three or four people refuse to put their phones away and then it goes into chaos, right? And so one of them is, is trying to establish a routine for them that helps them perform at their best. And the truth is, most of the kids today, if you want to be honest, are somewhat addicted to their phones, right? I mean, to a certain degree. And the relief that happens when you take their phones away on, which is part of the reason why, again, with volleyball, why I think they've done so well when they've gone to China. They spend that month in China without their phones for the most part because they can't use them in most places. And there's a relief that goes on when you can't have it. 
Like, you miss it, but then it's gone, and you relax, and you start playing board games, start communicating, and start talking. And any time that happens, conflict resolution improves, communication improves. So it comes down to a strategy, meaning it might be three hours before the game, no phones in the locker room, mm -hmm. right? No phones during team meals, right? Because if they don't set that tone, it never happens. And so some of it is them then seeing how much better things are when they don't have their phones. That's why some people love going to practice, by the way. Some of our athletes say, my best two hours are my day at practice. And you say, why? It's because it's the only time I'm fully present. I'm fully engaged. I'm not worrying about anything in the future or in the past. And I don't have that phone going off all day long. And they can put it away and just focus. So, yeah, the more, the, 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 the higher number of folks you have with that deal, you have to get buy-in from everybody because everybody loves their social media at different rates. And the best way I like to say it is, you know, if you're part of a team, is you know, you just got to check the phone in and write, and then for that two or three hours, it's work time or it's play time, if you will, and then you're back to it. But you do have to get buy-in, and uh, and I would just say, you know, you guys are all looking to be in a business that's about people. I mean, when you really think about golf and golf courses and everything that goes on there, not just playing, but the socialization part of it, I mean, you've got to communicate with people and you've got to get good at it. I mean, everybody will tell you, and you've met them, there are good teachers and people around the clubhouse and there are not. But in the end of the day, nobody's looking to come to golf just to see people doing this. Do you know what I mean? Your business is a very, very human business where communication and learning communication skills is very important. Um, and I just will say one more thing. We don't have a lot of time on mindfulness because it's a, it's a broad subject that's out there for people and, well, I don't think about it. Th this is kind of what I say. We've all experienced doing something where time just flies and then you're like, oh, wow, two hours went by. <laughs> and I don't know what that is for you, but you are starting to get in the here and now the awareness. You know, some people will call it the zone. Some people will call it, you know, Zen and the art of motorcycle repair. The bottom line is, if you know nothing about it, if you haven't read anything about it, those times where you are so focused on doing something that time seems to fly and you're just into something. And I would challenge you to find what those are and then try to repeat it and try to get into that more and more. And I can tell you for me, I literally have spent time with, you know, the monks of the world, I call them, that create this stuff. And I do a walk every morning, a meditation walk, and I just emulate them. I mean, I walk with my little steps like this. And why do I do that? Because I want to start the day, and I'm trying to get my mind into that type of awareness. And I do it before I go to bed. And if I get a chance, I take a power nap. Why do I do it? Because the more I practice getting my mind into that, then the more chances when I need to call upon it, I can, right? But it's not something that just happens. And for some folks, it's, you know, it's swinging a golf club. I can tell you that I get into the zone quite a bit, just sitting in a hitting bay, hitting golf balls. I really enjoy it. I can do it walking. I can get to the point where I really <coughs> feel like I can control getting in and out of it. The last one, and this is probably one that's, this is probably one you guys could use, you know, the golfers probably use more than anything else compared to even some other sports, which is the art of visualization or imagery. One thing we know on the science side is that every minute we visualize is about equivalent to seven minutes of practice. And visualiz visualization is simply doing mentally what we normally do physically. What we do know is that when we do that, it creates deeper and deeper grooves in what we call the muscle memory part of our brain. We all know muscle memory doesn't happen in our muscles. But those deeper, deeper tracks allow us to be able to do things in a repeatable fashion without even thinking about it. The hundred different movements you, used to, you need to be able to have. And we know that the brain cannot tell the difference between something that's real or imagined. We know that if you hook up downhill skiers to an EMG thing that measures your muscle firings, that if they just imagine going downhill, the same muscle patterns fire as, as if they actually do it. That's one example. And there's a hundred more examples, but visualization is a really critical skill that also helps you when you're tired and you can't take the physical reps that you need to. Um, so one example of visualization that applied to golf, I can tell you they did a study at the Olympic Training Center with 30 college golfers. 
30 college age golfers, and they broke them down into groups, and they had them all do a different plan. One was to focus on certain kinds of putting. The others could only visualize the putting themselves, and the others, the others, the third ones, either had to do one of two things. They had to visualize missing a putt to the right or to the left. Okay, there were three groups. The group that just putted and got to putt an extra hour a day, they improved by somewhere in the range of 20%. The ones who visualized doing things correctly improved by 17 or 18%, just by visualizing, no practicing. And the ones that were forced to visualize for something like 30 minutes a day, imagine putting it to the right or the left and missing the hole, they decreased by about 31%. So negative visualizations and forcing them to visualize negatively with college-level uh, golfers <coughs> deteriorated their putting scores. And if you ever practice that on your own, you can see what happened. If you imagined yourself missing the putt right before you did it, you would see how much it would deteriorate. So oh, yeah. a couple things. These four things can all be trained. Each one of these could be talked about in a lot more detail, but all four of these can be trained in a way that helps the person perform. Visualization, I would say, is one of the three, is one of the critical ones. I'll tell you real quickly, since you guys can tell the golf stories, it's a little bit embarrassing, but one of the things I was really good at was putt-putt golf. And you probably heard of putt-putt, but back in the day, before you were born, they used to have a show on Sunday mornings where people played for a lot of money. And, you know, there are 18 holes, obviously, and so the course record in Omaha was 21 at uh, one of the courses, and I was, I certainly wasn't a professional, but I had a chance in the tournament to beat the course record with two holes to go. Well, I needed to hold, I needed one hole in one, so I'd already had 15 holes in one. But my rods of control, I thought I was good at this stuff. I was good at goal setting, I was really good at self-talk, I was really good at visualization. But I knew nothing about arousal control. When I knew, I focused, when I got to the outcome, and I knew I had a shot to break the course record, that thing went out of my chest, and I hit two twos in a row, and I tied the course record. And so I know in the golf <coughs> world, maybe not your golf world, but in the putting world, that if you don't have control of all these things and practice them, I couldn't bring it down when I needed to because it had never happened before. And nobody taught my own skills back in the 80s, so it was just the way it was. So we wanted to show just one, do we have one more just like a two minute video? We wanted to show you a video on a pre-performance routine because this is a golfer you guys all know about. As a non-golfer or someone who's a beginner golfer, I noticed this this summer about this golfer from Australia, just how well defined his pre-performance routine was on the course. And you probably remember him without saying his name yet. He was a guy who passed out the day he won that tournament, but he had passed out on the course I think the day before because he was having vertigo. So let's watch this little video. We're all blessed because there's not a better example of a pre-shot routine and using the skills and somebody that's right now at the top of their game. Um, yeah, to have Jason Day out there, although it takes him a little while, you can clearly see. I am under a bit of stress. Uh, there is a lot of emotion, but a lot of uh, you know just controlling the stress levels. Uh, yeah, it does help a lot just to really kind of relax uh, before you go into the shot. Really try and focus on what you really need to do to go and hit the shot that you need to hit. And um, it's kind of worked its way into being more of a you know a relaxing visualization kind of technique going into a shot more so than just kind of seeing the shot now. You see the whole shot, or just parts of the shot starting for me. I see my swing. I see, uh, so say for instance, I'm standing here right now. I'm standing behind and I see me swing to the target. And uh, once, I, once I see that, I see my setup, and I see the swing go back, and then walk uh, through. I see the ball take off, and whatever, whatever I see, the draw back in the high low, uh, and I see it bounce and drop. See, just in that alone, he incorporates a uh, brief breathing technique, you know, so there's there's longer term ones that you can practice every day, and then there's ones that you, you need to do right when things are heat up a little bit. But he breathes the same way every time. I'm sure you guys are more familiar than this with me, but I was just struck by how he did it the same way every single shot. And I'm assuming he does that whether it's the smallest tournament in the world or whether he's in the final round and he's on top. And he has the exact same routine. He incorporates visualization, he incorporates breathing, 
incorporates a little bit of self-talk all into his routine every day. When we were at the PGA Seniors, again, for someone who's not around golf that much, that's what struck me the most. I followed Fred Couples around. I just couldn't believe how he had the same routine on every single shot, from his breathing to his pre-shot to what he practiced. And it was, and most of the golfers were that way, but you have to develop something that works for you. Everyone can have to do something different, but you've got to be able to do it and practice it every day again. So when he said that the emotions are there and the stress is there, you've got something to go to that you practice every day and you're not trying to figure it out when your mind's going crazy on you. And so maybe that happens at some point when you have to pass the test that you have to pass, but you have to practice that every day so that when you get to those moments that have more pressure involved, that you can, when you can do what you need to do and what you're trained to do. I think we ran over a little bit, so I, I'm sorry about that because I know it's Friday. Uh, the bottom line is, is these are not just skills for performance, they're really life skills. And like I said, I'm sure you've heard about them, how much you put them into practice, that's up to you, <coughs> right? And uh, not only proven in science, but when you look at high performers in sport in the military, this is what they're doing. They're spending time doing these things. It's really not rocket science, it's science based, but you've got to put it into practice. And I know as far as golf goes, you guys will all go beat balls. Well, give us 10% of your time working some of these skills and mastering them, and let me know. Because I'm going to guarantee you, if you spend time on these, not only is it going to help you in whatever you're trying to accomplish in life, it'll definitely help your golf game as well. If you be a better business person, better student, husband, mom, all that stuff. So. You know, appreciate your time. And if there's anything that you want, if there's anything that you wanted to learn in more detail one day, that's something you need to tell Scott. We're not opposed to coming back and focusing on something specific. We gave you five or six minutes on topics that you could spend an hour on. But if there's something more that that's on there that you want to learn more about that might help your golf game, then we'd be open to talking about those in a smaller group or something like that. So that'd be something that you'd have to get back to Scott on. So. Again, thank you for your time. Good luck with things. Thanks, guys.